evening, I think it was mentioned at the uh, opening of the service, we have Bible studies uh, for all ages, but on the first Sunday of the month we have a second uh, worship service, so tonight we're going to be uh, worshiping God and having a sermon from His Word. But thank you for coming, and please come be with us again anytime you have opportunity. We want to talk, as you can see from the slide I have up, about the worship of Jesus Christ, the passage that Brother Bud read for us in Matthew 2. Uh, I don't want to go on into a Christmas lesson, but I just can't help but mention just briefly about the misrepresentation sometimes that's made of the passage uh, at Christmas time. Uh, there are people who confuse things. They, they mix accounts together, and they mix the account from Luke chapter 2 and, and Matthew chapter 2 together uh, about the birth of Jesus, and they have the shepherds and the wise men all at the manger, and none of that happened. That's not the way it happened at all. Uh, it was the shepherds who came to the manger. The wise men, as we're going to read about here, didn't come until somewhere between 40 days and almost two years later, somewhere between that time period, between 40 days after his birth and two years later, the wise men came. And in fact, if you notice in verse 11, just very quickly, it says, when they came into the manger, no, that's not what it says at all, when they came into the house, so the wise men did not appear at the manger. That's mythology. That's what the world teaches. That's what the world teaches about Jesus and his birth, uh, but that's not what the scripture says. But I'm using the text this evening from a different perspective, and it records some events as my New King James reads, and I think most modern speech versions reads this way. It says, now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Not when, not on the day of, but after he was born. As I said, probably 40 days to two years afterwards. Several events occurred on that, at that time, and one of those events that's, that strikes me as we read through this text is the fact that Jesus Christ was worshipped from the get-go, from the very beginning. From the very time of his birth, he was worshipped, and you can see here in verse 2, the wise men who came from the east, they said, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. And so the word that's translated worship there means to kiss the hand toward. It means to show reverence. And so they came to worship Jesus. And so from the very moment of his birth, uh, and this, as I said, very early on, he is worshiped. You drop down here to verse 8, even Herod, uh, who's no friend of Jesus, by the way, and he's going to try and kill Jesus in a few verses later on in the text. But notice what he says. He understands that the king of the Jews was someone who would be divine, was someone who should be worshipped. He doesn't argue with the wise men about that at all. He says, it says there in verse 8, he sent to Bethlehem and he said, go and search carefully for the young child and when you've found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. So Herod understands that the king of the Jews was someone who was worthy of worship. And then verse 11, we read earlier, we didn't finish the verse, it says, when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, you and I, as Christians, take that all that for granted. You say, okay, big deal, preacher. What, what's, what's the big deal? But you might be surprised at the number of people who believe that it's wrong to worship Jesus. Now, some of those folks, it might make a little bit of sense. For example, Jews uh, who have not embraced Jesus, they believe that it would be wrong to worship Jesus. And, by the way, if they're correct in their belief that Jesus is not the Messiah, that Jesus is not the Son of God, then they would be correct. It would be a sin to worship Jesus. If He's not the Messiah, if He's not the Son of God, then it would be wrong to worship Jesus. And you see right away uh, two religions there that are totally at odds, the Jewish religion and the religion of Christ. And one believes that Jesus is deity and should be worshipped, and the other does not. And so there's no way that you can agree to disagree about something that's that important. But there are many Jews out there who would reject the worship of Jesus Christ. Muslims as well. They regard Jesus perhaps as a prophet, but certainly not the Son of God. And they ridicule people like us. They call us people of the book, and they're referring to the, the Bible. And they would ridicule the entire notion of worshiping Jesus. They believe that there's only one person in the Godhead, and that, of course, in their definition is Allah, not Jehovah, but Allah. And they are two different deities, by the way. And so they would reject the worship of Jesus Christ. But getting a little bit closer to home, and not too close yet, but we're getting there, getting a little bit closer to home, groups that claim to be Christian, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they claim to follow Christ, they claim to be uh, of some kind of Christian faith, and yet 
they do not believe in the divinity of Christ. They do not believe in the deity of Christ, and they believe, therefore, that it would be a sin uh, to worship Jesus. Uh, they also do not believe, by the way, in the deity of the Holy Spirit. They believe the Holy Spirit is simply a force. And so they believe you know, that there's one person in the Godhead, and that that is the Father, and that you would not worship, therefore, Jesus Christ. That would be wrong. That would be a sin. And there may be, no, there's not, it's not there may be, there are, I'll just say it that way, there are even some brethren who question the practice of worshiping Jesus Christ. So because the question comes up every once in a while, because it's something that we should be well versed on, we should know the scriptures pertaining to this, I thought it'd be good for us to spend a little time this morning talking, or this evening, talking about the worship of Jesus Christ. I got three or four points I want to make here. The first one uh, is based on what I would call generic authorization to worship Jesus Christ. You remember a, a while back we had a study on Bible authority and we talked about uh, direct statement and we talked about examples, how we learn, how we learn from God, uh, statements and examples and necessary implications and we talked about generic and specific authority. And there is generic authorization to worship Jesus in the scriptures. Now I'm presenting this to you in the form of a syllogism. That is a form of argumentation, it's a form of logic, where this is the point you're trying to conclude. You're trying to get to this point, that Jesus Christ is to be worshipped. That's what our lesson is about. And to get there, you have to take some steps of reasoning. And so you have what's called a major premise, and then a minor premise, and then the conclusion. And if the major premise is true, and if the minor premise is true, then the conclusion cannot be escaped. There's no way around that, and so you see the logic behind it. And so you just take a look at this for a second. The scriptures teach that Jesus Christ is God. You could not be a Christian if you did not believe that. That's required. Uh, if you're going to be a Christian, you have to believe that he is God. And I just put a few passages up here. In John 1 and verse 1, we're familiar with it. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he's referring there in that passage to Jesus. In fact, in verse 14 of the same chapter, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Word there is Jesus. And the passage clearly says in John 1, 1, that the Word was God, or the Word was divine, or the Word was deity. That all means and says exactly the same thing. So we've established the major premise that Jesus Christ is God. But that may not be enough scripture for you, so we'll move on to another passage in John chapter 20 and verse 28, the story of Thomas, doubting Thomas, as we sometimes say. And Thomas was actually, uh, I think, doing a good thing. Never swallow what somebody else says just because they say it. They were saying Jesus is risen from the dead. And Thomas was not quite ready to believe that. I'm not going to believe that without some proof. I need some proof. You know, that's not inherently a bad thing. We make fun of Thomas, and we call him doubt, Doubting Thomas, but it's not a bad thing to ask for proof. I want to see book, chapter, and verse. I want to see proof, you see. And Thomas says, I want to see proof. You tell me Jesus is risen from the dead, but I want to see proof. I want to see the print of the nails in his hands. I want to be able to put my hand in his side. I remember they stuck a spear in his side. I want to be able to put my hand in his side. I want proof. Uh, you tell me he's alive, I want it. So Jesus appeared a week later, and without any introductions. He just walked into the room and he said, Thomas, <laughs> as though he already knew what Thomas had been talking about, even though as far as Thomas was concerned, he wasn't anywhere around. Thomas, here I am. Reach here your hand into my side. Put your hands into the print of the nails in my hand and do not be faithless but believing. And in John 20 and verse 28, you know what Thomas said? My Lord and my God. Now, Thomas was not doing what a lot of people do today. They say that and they're taking the Lord's name in vain. That's not what Thomas was doing. The Greek there literally is the Lord of me and the God of me. And that's what he was saying. I know who you are now. You are the Lord of me and you are the God of me. And so Jesus Christ is God. And then another passage, and again we could multiply these on and on, but Acts 20 and verse 28 when Paul was talking to the elders at Ephesus, he said, Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd, listen carefully, to shepherd the church of God. Stop right there. The what? The church of God. All right, you got that? And then he says, which he purchased with his own blood. If you know anything about language, the word he there is a pronoun, and there has to be an antecedent. What's he referring back to? God, the church of God, which he, who? God, purchased with his own blood. 
But who shed his blood? Was it not Jesus? Yes, it was. And so does that not establish the divinity of Christ? The church, to say church of God is to say church of Christ. It's the same thing because Christ is God and Christ was the one who shed his blood. And passages could be multiplied. So we have established the major premise. That is true. There is no doubt. If you believe the scriptures and if the scriptures are true, if the scriptures are the word of God, then Jesus Christ is God. Minor premise, God is to be worshipped. That should be readily accepted by all. We sang several songs tonight, thanks to Brother Eric, uh, talking about worshiping God. And with one passage here, we could multiply these passages as well, but in Matthew 4, this was at the temptation of Christ, when he was led out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The devil said, if you'll fall down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth. And Jesus answered and he said, get away from me, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So that passage and many others tells us that God is to be worshipped. Now, look at, the, look at the logic here. Jesus Christ is God. You believe that. If you're a Christian, there's no way you can be a Christian without believing that. You believe that. God is to be worshipped. That's why we came here tonight. We came here to worship God. And so if the major premise is true, and if the minor premise is true, then the conclusion is inescapable, isn't it? There's just no way you can get around that. There's no rational way, there's no logical way, there's no way in the world you can get around that. That is flawlessly logical. Jesus Christ is God, God is to be worshipped, therefore Jesus Christ is to be worshipped. So we have established generic authority. We could stop the lesson right there. That's all the authority we need. We could just stop right there. That's all the authority that we need to worship Jesus Christ. But I want to take this a little further and show you just how common this was. Jesus Christ was worshipped on earth, both before and after his crucifixion. Now stop and, and think about it. We read that and, and we don't think a lot about it, but think about this for a second. When he was on earth, he didn't have, like we see in these paintings, he didn't have, everybody else was wearing dingy brown robes and Jesus is wearing a big bright white robe. And everybody else looks normal, but Jesus has got this halo floating around his head. That's the way the artists portray it, but that's not the way it really was. If you walked into a crowd, you wouldn't, if you didn't know who Jesus was, you wouldn't be able to tell him from anybody else. He just looked like one of the crowd. He just looked like one of the guys, you see. He would be one of the people there. And, and yet people would go up to this individual and treat him as though he were God. Treat him as though he were divine and worship him. Now, if he's not God, that would be blasphemous, wouldn't it? Sure it would. And yet we read over and over and over and over again that during his 33 years upon the earth he was worshipped by men. We start off in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, remember we read that, it says, we have come, we've seen his star in the east and we have come to worship him. And then I'll just skip down to verse 11 and once again, just to remind you, when they came into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And so at his birth, or shortly thereafter in Matthew 2, he was worshipped as a baby. Think of that, falling down before a baby and worshiping a baby. Why? Because this baby is no ordinary baby. This baby is God. This baby is divine. This baby is deity. During his earthly life, and these passages could be multiplied, the worship during his life, I just put two up there, and most of these references I've kept confined to the Gospel of Matthew. By no means are the scriptures limited that way, but I've kept these references confined to Matthew just for simplicity's sake. Over in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 2, for context we'll read verse 1. When he had come down from the mountain, now that's the, the mountain from which he just delivered the Sermon on the Mount. We're getting ready to start a study next Sunday night on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthews chapters 5, 6, and 7. And after that sermon is completed in chapter 8, he came down from the mountain, he's done preaching, and great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leopard came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. So here's a, an ordinary uh, man, a leper coming up, and falling down and worshiping Jesus, knowing full well who he is. Lord, see how, what he called him? Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. You can cleanse me of my leprosy. Moving on out to Matthew, the ninth chapter, and verse 18. It says, While he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshiped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. Notice that this man is a ruler. And yet he knows that there's one over him. 
There's one above him. There's one mightier than he. And he falls down before him and worships him. And he's talking there once again about Jesus. And these examples could be multiplied again and again and again. That he's worshipped during his earthly life. I think perhaps of more significance of, than that for us is the fact that he was worshipped by his apostles. You see, this was, his, this was his inner circle, if you please. He had these 12 men who followed him around every place that he went. They were learning from him. They were being trained by him. And they are the ones who, who have written our New Testaments. They are the ones who tell us about Jesus and who he was and what he did. And so they're primary witnesses. They're first-hand eyewitnesses. And they leave their testimony behind for us. And they worship Jesus. In Matthew, the 14th chapter, we have an occasion where Jesus walked on the water. In my Bible over there. The account begins in verse 22. We're not going to read the whole thing, but we can just pick up portions here. Verse 25, it says, Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. Now, the them he went to were the apostles. Verse 22 uh, it says, Jesus made his disciples get in the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Verse 25, he's walking on the sea. Then they think, well, it's a ghost, verse 26. And Jesus said, verse 27, no, 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 it's just me. Don't be afraid. And Peter says in verse 28, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. Lord, if that's really you, if you're not a ghost, if you're not an apparition, if you're not something else, it was really you. Command me to come to you when you're on the water. And he said, come. And so Peter gets out, and he starts walking on the water. And then, of course, Peter, we've heard many a sermon on that. Peter took his eyes off of Jesus. When you take your eyes off Jesus, bad things happen. He took his eyes off Jesus. He's looking at the waves and the wind. And he thinks, oh, this is bad. I'm going to sink. And that's exactly what he begins to do because he took his eyes off Jesus. And so he says, Lord, verse 30, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him. And he said, oh, you have little doubt, why, or you have little faith, excuse me, why did you doubt? Verse 33, then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Jesus Christ was worshipped even by his apostles. Very important, very significant, because we talk about apostolic example, apostolic example. So the apostles worshipped Jesus. Some folks will accept this, and they'll say, well, that was different. Now he's raised from the dead, and things have changed. The covenant has changed. Things have changed. Well, Jesus was worshipped after his resurrection as well. In Matthew, the 28th chapter, coming out to the end of the Gospel of Matthew. This is after the resurrection of Jesus. You can read about his resurrection in the first eight verses. But in verse 9, it says, they went to tell his disciples, that is, that he had been risen. They went to tell his disciples, and Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him, worshipping Jesus after his resurrection. Verse 16 and 17. Then the eleven disciples, by the way, that's the apostles. <laughs> the eleven disciples went away to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. So once again, even after his resurrection, and I'll throw one more in for good measure, it's not on the chart, but even after his ascension into heaven, he was worshipped. Take your Bibles and turn over to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. That's the last chapter in the Gospel of Luke. In fact, we're going to be reading the last few verses of the Gospel of Luke. Luke 24, verse 50. It says, They led him out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands, and he blessed them. That's Jesus. And it came to pass... While he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. This is, that's his ascension. And so he's gone. And it says, they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. So even after his resurrection and even after his ascension, he was worshipped. So look at what we've established. We've established generic authorization. Jesus is God. God is to be worshipped, therefore Jesus Christ is to be worshipped. There is no way around that. That is flawlessly logical. Not because I concocted it, but because it's in the Bible. It's there in the book. And then we've established credible, clear examples, multiple examples of Jesus being worshipped all through his life, from his birth all the way to his ascension back into heaven. But there's more. Did you know that Jesus was worshipped by the early church? And we still do it today. We came here today to worship Jesus Christ. Oh, no, preacher, we worship the Father. Well, that's true, we do. 
first song we sang. I think it was the first one. Father, we love you. We worship and adore you. Jesus, we love you. We worship and adore you. Spirit, we love you. We worship and adore you. Yes, we came here to worship the Father. Yes, we came here to worship the Spirit. But we also came here to worship Jesus Christ. It boggles my mind how someone could even question this. How can you question the, the worship of God? How do you question the worship of Jesus Christ? And every first day of the week we gather and take this thing called the Lord's Supper. Just, let's just go read that account in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I want you to think about it in a context, in the context of our lesson. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, Paul is reminding them of what's supposed to happen during the Lord's Supper. He's reminding them of the institution of the Lord's Supper when Jesus first instituted it. He says in verse 23, I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he come. Think of that. That is an act of worship that is all about Jesus. There's no Father in that. There's no Holy Spirit in that. This isn't a memorial of the death of the Holy Spirit. This isn't a memorial of the death of the Father. This is a memorial of Jesus Christ. This is an act of worship that's centered, focused entirely on Jesus Christ. That's what it's all. If you took the Lord's Supper, you worshiped Jesus. Now you may say, no, I didn't. Yes, you did. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, you did. You worshiped Jesus Christ because that's what the Lord's Supper is all about. And then there's teaching and singing. I, I, I could put many, many passages up there, but I chose this one on, on purpose. Colossians 3, verses 16 and 17. And I link teaching and singing together because there are a great number of similarities between the two. Singing is actually a form of teaching according to the scriptures. In Colossians 3, verse 16 and 17, Paul says, Let the word of, of who? <laughs> Christ. You see that? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Well, what's going to be the evidence that the word of Christ is dwelling in me in all wisdom? Well, one of the things that's going to happen is I'm going to be teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So look at that. You've got the word of Christ how am I going to get that dwelling in me? Teaching. I'm going to be taught. Someone's going to teach me or I'm going to teach myself. And I'm going to be looking into that Bible and looking into that Word. And whose Word is it? It's the Word of Christ, isn't it? When I get up here to preach, even tonight, I'm preaching from the Word of Christ. And so, would that not glorify Christ? Would not that not bring honor and glory to Christ? Does that not worship Christ? Sure it does. Oh, but it worships the Father. Sure it does. It does worship the Father, and it worships the Spirit. It's kind of hard to separate it, isn't it? If, there, if there's one God made of three persons, it's kind of hard to separate those. We like to separate them in our mind. But if you're worshiping the Father, it's kind of hard to do that without coming to Jesus. And if you're going to worship Jesus, it's kind of hard to do that without bringing the Father in. it. It's all together. And here he describes it as the Word of Christ. And he talks about singing. And look at, look at this. Look who we're singing to. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And someone says, that's the Father. Is it? Is it? Look at the next verse. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. <laughs> the Lord there in that context is not the Father. The Lord in that context is Jesus. So we sing to Jesus. The songs that we sang tonight, we sang to Jesus. We sang them to the Father. We sang them to the Spirit. But we certainly sang them to Jesus. And so when we come together together, to, to worship by singing. We're worshiping Jesus. And when we hear the word of Christ taught, we're worshiping Jesus. How could we not be? That's bringing glory and honor to Jesus Christ. The giving. We put money in the collection plate. That's all about honoring Jesus. Did you know that? We don't usually think of it that way. But, but look at what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 8. Let me set this up while you're turning over there. 2 Corinthians 8, Paul, this is the second letter he writes to the Corinthians, and he's encouraging them to complete their contribution. We always quote those verses on Sunday morning, you know. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, on the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by in store. 
And then we go to 2 Corinthians 9, usually. Uh, Let each man give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So 1 Corinthians, he's getting the thing started. 2 Corinthians, he's saying, finish it up now. Get this collection together so that when Paul and his companions come by, they can pick it up and move on to Jerusalem. Get it ready. But look at, in 2 Corinthians 8, what Paul says about their giving. He says, in verse 8, first of all, I speak not by commandment. But I'm testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. Now, what he's saying there is giving is giving. Giving is not a tax. Giving is not something that you're forced to do. You give from a free will. You give from a free heart. You give because you want to. And then he goes right into the ultimate example of giving. You see that in the next verse? For you know the grace of who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich... Yet for your sakes, he became poor. He gave it all away, didn't he? He gave the ultimate gift. He gave himself. For your sakes, he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Do you not understand what he's saying here? When I give, I'm supposed to give as who? As Christ. And what did he give? He gave it all. He gave the ultimate gift. He gave sacrificially, and that becomes my, act, my example, my pattern. And so how could your giving not glorify Christ? How could your giving not worship Christ? Of course it worships Christ. Does it worship the Father? Well, sure it does. Does it worship the Spirit? Sure it does. But we cannot deny that it also worships Christ. Read on. He says in verse 10, And in this I give my advice, as to your advantage, not only to be doing what you began and were desiring to do a year ago, but now you must complete the doing of it, that it was there as, a, as there was a readiness to desire it, even so there may be a completion of what you have. For if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what one does not have. You can't give the gift Christ gave, but God will take what you've got. That's, that's really what that means. It's accepted according to what one has. I don't have a life to give for the sins of the world. I can't do that. But I can give something. I can give myself. I can give my time. I can give my talents. And in this context, I can give my financial resources. And in all of that, I'm glorifying Christ. Yes. When we lay by in store on the first day of the week, we are worshiping Christ. And this one, this is the one that bothers a lot of people. I don't know why. But it bothers a lot. Praying to Jesus. Can't do that, they'll say. Have to pray to the Father. Somebody should have told the writers of the Bible that. Because that's not what they say. Now, should we pray to the Father? Sure. I got no problem with that. Most of my prayers, when I start off, I say, Lord or Heavenly Father. Most of the time I do that. And most of us do the same thing. I got no problem with that. But the issue is, can I say the same thing to Jesus? And I believe I can. In John 14, and verse 14, and by the way, this, aren't, this isn't all the passages. I just put a few up here. There's more. But in John 14, in verse 14, Jesus said, and I'm reading from the New King James. I, I'm telling you that for a reason here in just a second, which will become clear. In John 14, 14, Jesus said, If you ask anything in my name, my Heavenly Father will do it. That's not what it says, is it? Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Do you understand what he's saying? There? I will respond to your prayers. Now, how am I going to respond to your prayers if you're not praying to me? Now, I said I was reading from the New King James. Some of the other versions, English Standard, perhaps NIV, some of these others, they'll say, it says this. It's a variant in the Greek. If you ask me anything, that makes it even clearer, doesn't it? If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So if I can't talk to Jesus, what are we going to do with that? Because that was Jesus who said that. <laughs> what are you going to do with that verse? Are you going to take it out of your Bible, cut it out, take a marker and mark it out? Jesus said that, not Lanny. Jesus did. In 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter, in verse 22, Paul's winding up his, his letter to the Corinthians, his first letter. And he says in verse 22, If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. And then, depending on your translation, some translations will say, Maranatha, if I pronounce that correctly. The literal rendering of that is, as it reads in my New, New King James Version, O Lord, come. That's prayer. The prayer for the coming of the Lord. Question, who's coming? Is the Father coming? Father not coming. Holy Spirit coming? Nope. Jesus is coming. That's a prayer to Jesus. Paul is saying, Lord, come on. We're ready for you. We're ready. We're waiting. We're ready for you. By the way, do you pray that prayer? 
Or do you say, I hope you hold off as long as possible so I can do all this sinning I want to do before I, you know, which way do we look at this? The, 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 the early church said, come on, Lord, we're ready. We're ready for you. That's prayer to Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, now we've made the point, and I think rightly so, the red letters really don't mean a whole lot. I understand that. But if you have a red letter Bible, you might look at this passage. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 and 9, Paul had this thing, he called it a thorn in the flesh, and people have wondered for years, what was that? What was this thorn in the flesh? Jan Bozier thinks it was a men's business meeting. I mean, <laughs> you know, that's as good as argument as I've ever heard. I think that might be right. I don't know. But we don't know, honestly, we don't know what his thorn in the flesh was. He says, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said, if you have a red letter version, in red letters, and the reason I'm saying that is, guess who's talking here? Christ. He prayed to who? Christ. And Christ answered him, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now we're not done. And by the way, you don't need the red letters to prove this. Someone said, well, the translators put those in. Okay. You don't need the red letters to prove this. Who did he pray to? Verse 8, the Lord. Who is this Lord? Verse 9, therefore I will gladly boast in my infirmities that the what? The power of the Father? No, the power of Christ. Christ was the Lord to whom he prayed in that verse. That's why the translators put the red letters there. Because they want us to understand that that's Jesus answering that prayer. It was Jesus that Paul prayed to. And it was Jesus answering that prayer. Let's move out here to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. And Paul, just as plain as day, gives a prayer to Jesus. And I thank the Holy Spirit. No. And I thank the Father. No. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. That's a prayer to Jesus, folks. That's, there's no way around that. Now someone says, you can't do that. Well, you suppose that Paul said, Heavenly Father, tell Jesus I'm thankful in Jesus' name. You suppose that's the way that worked? I don't think it was. I think if you want to say thank you, Jesus, you just say thank you, Jesus. I don't think, I don't think you have to go to the Father to say thank you, Jesus. I can say thank you, Jesus, right now, and you can do it too. And, th and that scripture is your authority for it. Revelation chapter 5. This is an interesting passage. Have the vision in heaven. John is caught up into heaven. He gets to see some glorious things that you and I have never seen. All we know is what he wrote about it. But it must have been an amazing thing to be in John's shoes and see these, these events. To see the throne of God in heaven. And in chapter 5, he sees not only the throne of God, but the Lamb of God. And that's Jesus. And it says here in Revelation 5 and verse 8, it says, when he had taken the scroll, and that was the lamb who took the scroll from the Father's hand. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before who? The lamb. What are they doing? Why are they falling down before him? Because they're worshiping him. They fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense. Watch it now, which are the prayers of the saints. The prayers of the saints. Where are those prayers going? To the lamb. Can you see that in verse 8? They fell down before the Lamb, and they offered the prayers of the saints to the Lamb. And if that's not plain enough for you, read on. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and you've redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you've made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Who've been made kings and priests? We have. Who are these people talking to? The Lamb. The Lamb. They're praying to Jesus. And I looked and I heard the voice of many angels round the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is who? The Lamb. Why is He worthy? He was slain, and He's worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And someone says, well, that's just the creatures up there in heaven. All right, let's read on. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth. Are you a creature on the earth? You sure are. You sure are. Every creature was in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them I heard saying, Blessed and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. And these passages can be multiplied. 
And, when I, and I did the, every act of worship that we engage in, we, talk about, we, we call them the five items of worship or the five acts of worship, whatever language you, you choose to use here. But we do these things every Sunday. And every time we do them, we're worshiping Jesus Christ. There's just no way around that, folks. So we've established that by generic authority. We established it by example of the, er, of the early Christians and early people who were, who were listening to Jesus, and we established it here by the early church and by us. We do the same thing today based on this apostolic example. Now, nobody is saying here that we shouldn't worship the Father. I'm well aware of John 4 and verse 23 where Jesus said, God is spirit, and they, those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And he, he, made, he made a statement like this, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. Of course we should worship the Father. Of course we should. He's God. It's the same reason we should worship Jesus. And I'm not saying here we shouldn't worship the Holy Spirit. Of course we could. We should. Over in, just in case you're wondering about that, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, I'll throw this passage in for good measure here. 2 Corinthians 13 in verse 14, the last passage, this is a prayer. And he says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. That's, a, that's called a benediction prayer. That's exactly what that is. And it's addressed to all three members of the Godhead. He talks about the grace of Jesus. He talks about the love of God. And in that context, that God would be the Father. And the communion of the Holy Spirit, all three members. So yes, we should worship the Father. Yes, we should worship the Spirit. But yes, we may and should and must, I would say, worship Jesus Christ. So I hope the lesson has given you some things to think about. That Jesus is worthy of our praise. That Jesus is worthy of our worship. I, I want to throw in, I said this other one was my last passage. I'm going to throw in one more. I'm going to throw in one more. In Philippians chapter 2, in verses 9 and following. Because this is really where all this lesson is headed right here, if you just think about it. He talked about in the earlier verses, verses 5 through 9, how that, or 5 through 8, how that Jesus emptied himself and, and became man and, and, and was obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. And we read those passages, we talk about Jesus dying for our sins. But then he says in verse 9, therefore God has highly exalted him. Who did he exalt? Jesus. And given him the name which is above every name. There's no name higher than the name of Jesus Christ. Now, if there's no name higher than the name of Jesus Christ, how can I not but worship him? And he goes on to say not only that, but he says in verse 10, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. That's an expression of worship. To bow the knee, to bow before, to kneel before God. To kneel before Jesus Christ. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. That was the picture we saw in the book of Revelation, by the way. That's the same picture. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So let's all make sure that we praise the Lamb because He's certainly worthy. Take out your songbooks and turn to the song of invitation. All things are ready. Now we usually think, and actually that was told, told in the context of a parable. See that? I prepared my dinner. All things are ready. We think about holiday time, you know. Anna takes credit for it, but I did all the cooking. Christian. <laughs> Not really. Not really. But she's worked and she's prepared and she's cooked and she has all the family come over. And then there comes that time, the best time of the day. All things are ready. Come to the feast. And we think of it in those terms, but the Lord's trying to get us to see that in a, in a, in a more important light, spiritual light. There's a great feast waiting for us in Christ and ultimately in heaven. And everything's ready. The preparations have been made. The Lord Jesus came into this world and lived a perfect life and offered that life on a cross so that I could be set free from my sins, so that I could walk away scot-free from my sins. And he did it for me, and he did it for you, and he did it for every person who ever has or ever will live. He made that ultimate sacrifice. Everything's ready. He sent the Holy Spirit into the world to guide the apostles into all truth, so we'd have a written record of it that I'm still preaching to this very day. And every other faithful preacher on the earth is preaching that same written record to this very day. All things are ready. It's ready. It's ready. It's up to you to come to the feast. You want something good, you've got to come to the table. You've got to come and get it. That's really the, the Lord ringing the dinner bell, so to speak. 
Come and get it. Come and be saved. Come and enjoy the great blessings of heaven. Come and enjoy the forgiveness of sins. Come and enjoy the privilege of prayer. Come and enjoy fellowship with God. Come and enjoy fellowship with brothers and sisters of like faith. Come and you can have all of this, but you got to come. And that's the invitation tonight. If you need to come, then come to Christ now while we stand, while we sing.